Welcome to Win the Studio, now in our 22nd consecutive year. I'm Red Beard, with the stories behind history's greatest rock albums. Today in the studio, it's part one of the 30th anniversary of Pink Floyd's The Wall. I finally got so angry that I spat at this child. Well, child, he was 14 or 15, I suppose. And when I came off stage afterwards, I thought, what have I been reduced to here? And what, you know, what has happened to the relationship between the band and the audience? And, and, and uh, so the wall was something that I experienced very powerfully through most of that tour, but specifically on that day. In the studio with Red Beard, this is David Gilmore of Pink Floyd. Welcome back in the studio. I'm Nick Mason of Pink Floyd with Red Beard. This is Roger Waters in the studio for The Wall. 30 years ago, the curtain was about to fall on the 70s decade. Arguably, the 70s began in a musical sense with the 1972 release of Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon album and the London Quartet of Rick Wright on keyboards, singer-guitarist David Gilmour, drummer Nick Mason, and singer-bass player Roger Waters was about to release a double album, Rock Opera, that would serve as a musical bookend to that decade. Punk rockers on both sides of the Atlantic had, by November 1979, made their point indelibly that, for the most part, rock and roll had grown bloated or simply gone flat, like soda pop left open all night, leaving fans feeling disconnected from the musicians. Roger Waters of Pink Floyd was feeling it, too, from the other side of the stage lights. By the time the recording sessions began for The Wall in April 1979, Waters had become Pink Floyd's dominant creative force. Although David Gilmour's co-writing and guitar sound were crucial elements, it was Waters who controlled the musical concepts. Just a few years later, Roger Waters' insistence on creative control of Pink Floyd would alienate him from Gilmour and Mason and eventually lead to his departure. But in 1979, it was Roger Waters who set the Pink Floyd agenda. I bought a tape. In fact, I bought two tapes to the first listening session, which um, one was um, The Wall and the other was The Pros and Cons of Hitchhiking. I'd had a rather fertile time, so I was terribly efficient, and I gave folders to the other guys in the band, and we all sat down and listened to these two demo tapes, and I said, I'm going to do one of these as a solo album, and we'll do one as a band album because I was beginning to feel the need to do something on my own and I, I, I gave them the choice and they quite cleverly chose the wall it was Roger Waters vision that built the wall his concept his story his personal passion play Waters wrote most of the music and all of the lyrics and Roger Waters recalls how the album and later the concert show of The Wall began. So much happened in the show that it would take an enormous amount of time to explain it all I mean, the audience come in and there's about 40% of the wall across the arena. So it's a jagged kind of line, a bit like uh, the inside of the album sleeve. An announcer came on and made a speech in a dinner jacket. He was actually an actor, but I, I wanted to make a point during the show. So I had this guy come on and say, please don't block the freeways and don't do this and don't do that and don't do... and and all those kind of things that people say in shows. But it, it, that was actually a device for something that happened later on. And then um, the band appeared, but in all the black stuff, and it was actually the surrogate band on a, on a stage out front, and they were all wearing masks, so they looked like us, but they weren't us. They were four other guys, and they played uh, the beginning of In the Flesh. A drape went up behind the wall, and there we were. And, and then a plane came in from the back, you know, a, a model kind of stood for about 15, 20 feet wingspan and went over a bit of the wall, and a kind of explosion happens, and then the baby cries, and then we go into the thin ice, and then the band are revealed on the back while this band at the front for the audience realizes that the people that they applauded starting are not actually employed by somebody else. And, Oh, I did. And it went on like that for, until the end of the first half. Yeah. 
The themes that Roger Waters explored in The Wall, questions about alienation and madness, were not new ones for him. His bleak visions of a society losing touch with itself had also permeated Pink Floyd's 1977 album, Animals. As Pink Floyd grew more and more successful, as the audiences and the profits grew larger and larger, Roger Waters found himself feeling isolated and out of touch, cut off from the real world, cut off from himself. For Roger Waters, that emotional barrier, that personal wall, was something real and frightening. I asked Waters if he believes it's a universal human dilemma. I think everybody does, yeah. It's just that, uh, happily, some people's walls are uh, smaller than others. I think mine was a, a big one. I, actually, I think an awful lot of people's walls are enormous and insurmountable. And they never, ever get past them. I don't know what they do. They become, um, you know, armed robbers or politicians or um, th they may stay completely in the depths and, uh, you know, in the, what we would, uh, what would appear to us to be the kind of dregs of society and hang around on street corners mugging people. Or they may equally uh, rise to positions of great power. Uh, they're the dangerous ones, the ones that are cut off but are nevertheless in positions of uh, some political power. I think we all know people who, could, who would do a better job as uh, President of the United States than Ronald Reagan or George Bush, but they don't become President of the United States because they wouldn't touch the position with a barge pole, you know, because they're more humane than that and they can't... And they're, and they're not prepared to waste all the energy that you have to waste in lying and cheating and going to committee meetings and kissing babies and shaking hands and all that crap that, they, that those people have to go through in order to achieve the positions of power that they eventually do or that some of them do. So the flaw in democracy is that the guy who is going to work hard enough to get your vote is almost in, inevitably and invariably not the right man to vote for. <laughs> it's a paradox, I think. That's the song Mother from Pink Floyd's The Wall, with Roger Waters singing the verses and David Gilmour on the choruses. Up next, we'll find out what first inspired Roger Waters to write The Wall, and we'll hear about the school children who sang on Pink Floyd's first number one single. For this and your other favorite interviews, visit inthestudio.net. I'm Redbeard. You're in the studio for The Wall, 30th Anniversary, Part 1. Get in the studio with Redbeard. This is David Gilmore of Pink Floyd. Welcome back in the studio. I'm Nick Mason of Pink Floyd with this Redbeard. This is Roger Waters in the studio for The Wall. Thank you, guys. This is Part 1 of The Wall's 30th Anniversary. I asked Roger Waters to share his inspiration for The Wall. The idea derived from the, the theatrical idea of, of constructing a, a wall between a rock and roll band and the audience that it was purporting to communicate with. And that idea arose specifically out of the Animals tour. Because we were playing in stadiums almost exclusively uh, for the first time, and uh, it became clear to me after doing one or two uh, from the conversation backstage and from the response in front of the stage and for the things that happened afterwards and from the injuries and the this and the that and the general vibe I got that this was no longer musicians writing and uh, performing songs and uh, well it was but that was no longer important what had become important was the gross it really upset me over a period we were, I don't know, playing stadiums for six or seven weeks and it really started to get to me. And the last one we did was in Montreal in the Olympic Stadium. 90,000 people stretching forever into the distance, chain link fencing in front of the stage. Kids on, a, you know, ap apparently on some kind of um, Pavlovian dog trip of... Uh, screaming their heads off from the moment that we appeared on stage till the moment we left. Nobody listening, to, well, not nobody, I'm sure there were a lot of people in the audience who were trying to listen. Very difficult for an audience to pay attention to what's going on. And what was important, and I've been to lots of stadium shows since, and with the exception, I think, of Live Aid, they're all the same. What's important, uh, you know, is the demagogy, is the worship of the very rich people 
Uh, I mean, rich in, in terms of having earned a lot of money, but also maybe rich in terms of the way the audience perceives how it must be to have written such and such a song or to be that popular or whatever. It's the worship of, of, um, of idols from afar, and I find it distressing. Guitarist vocalist David Gilmore of Pink Floyd. The stadium tour started in 1973 when Dark Side of the Moon was out. Uh, we were doing stadiums um, immediately as soon as uh, sort of money got up into the into the top ten, um, and it was a major change for us because uh, um, the audiences just made so much more noise. I mean, we weren't uh, we weren't ever exclusively doing stadiums. We would be doing some cities. We would be doing the the arenas and multiple nights in arenas in um, you know in in the big cities as well as stadiums. It would be sort of balanced out between the two. But I don't re recall that the Animals tour was any different, uh, really, in, in the way it was done to the uh, Dark Side of the Moon or the Wish You Were Here tours, but it was a bit longer. It was, it, it, we, we used toured fairly consistently for six months with the Animals tour, and uh, that was a, a big one for us. It was quite a shock to the system to be confronted with people uh, down the front all screaming to hear us play Money when the, our sort of... Previously, our sort of slightly more reverential audiences, you might say, were sitting in absolute silence waiting to hear the next pin being dropped very, very subtly and delicately from Nick's fingers. Roger Waters. So, uh, at the end of this Montreal show, I found myself, there was some kid trying to climb up the chain link fencing. I got so angry with this kid who was screaming all through, I don't know, Mother or and one of the quieter songs, anyway. I finally got so angry that I spat at this child. Well, child, he was 14 or 15, I suppose. And when I came off stage afterwards, I thought, what have I been reduced to here? What, you know, what has happened to the relationship between the band and the audience? And, and, and uh, so the wall was something that I experienced very powerfully through most of that tour, but specifically on that day. So at that point, I thought, well, if I ever go out on the road again, because I was very sorely tempted never to do it again, there are two things. One, I will never play in a big stadium again because I think it's wrong. It's not the right place for rock and roll to be. It's only about greed and ego. And two, I need to express these feelings about how I feel about the breakdown of whatever between me and the audience. And so that was really the start of the war. Most people perceived another brick in the wall part two as an attack upon you education and teachers, and, which it wasn't at all. It was a part of a, of a, of a large story of, of my autobiography, if you like, but it was never meant as a broad attack upon education, because education is obviously very important. An educated human being is, is often... Uh, well, actually, no, that's stupid. I was going to say he's often happier than an uneducated one, but of course that's not true at all. But I think if you live in an urban environment, it is necessary to know a bit about a lot of things if you're going to make any sense of it and work out how you can be happy. Ironically, this album, Roger Waters' Attack on the Dark Side of Rock Stardom, yielded Pink Floyd's first number one single, Another Brick in the Wall Part Two. Waters' diatribe against cruel, sarcastic teachers featured the voices of some actual school children, recorded in London by engineer Nick Griffiths. We sent him a multi-track tape over from L.A., and I spoke to him on the phone, will you do this, I want you to get some kids in and do this, and he went, all right, I'll do that, and so he went into the studio on his own in London and put the kids on another brick too. And I'll never forget this uh, multi-track coming back, arriving back at Producers Workshop in L.A. by a courier. I got it out of the box and said, put this on, put this on. And they put it onto the uh, multi-track. And uh, we just pushed all the faders up to kind of halfway up and played it without any mixing at all. And I remember the first time I heard it go by, shivers going down my spine. I thought, well, this is fantastic. Islington Green School, it was called. And it's a primary school, uh, so it's from kids aged 6 to 11. And it was the local school where our studio, where the Pink Floyd studio was in, in North London. 
it's a kind of working class neighborhood, sort of half and half, black and white kids, and a not very well off neighborhood. And of course they came in and they, they rather liked this song. They thought it was quite good. And so they sang it with, under Nick's direction, they sang it with great gusto, and I thought the result was just marvellous. And as soon as I heard it, I said, that is the single. That's David Gilmour on vocal for Goodbye Blue Sky from Pink Floyd's The Wall. Up next, Roger Waters, Nick Mason, and David Gilmour lift the curtain on The Wizard of The Wall. I'm Redbeard. For this and your other favorite interviews, visit inthestudio.net. You're in the studio for the 30th anniversary of Pink Floyd's The Wall, Part 1. In the studio with Red Beard. This is David Gilmore of Pink Floyd. Welcome back in the studio. I'm Nick Mason of Pink Floyd with this, Red Beard. This is Roger Waters in the studio for The Wall. It's the 30th anniversary of the November 1979 release of Pink Floyd's The Wall, the second best-selling original album in U.S. history. David Gilmore and Roger Waters had produced most of Pink Floyd's albums themselves. But for the enormous challenge of recording the double album rock opera The Wall, Pink Floyd wisely enlisted veteran rock producer Bob Ezrin. Roger Waters explains why. He would be prepared to argue with me about things. He's articulate enough to be, you know, it's no good arguing with me in the studio and saying, I don't like that. You know, you've got to explain to me why you don't like it and why we should do it a different way or make a suggestion or whatever, you know. And Bob is, is articulate and uh, quite able to do that. So we had a good, lively relationship making the record. He was a very good uh, musical and intellectual sounding board for me because he's a quite... He's very bright and he's quite tough as well. And so we could sit and talk about what it was about ad nauseam, which was absolutely invaluable because I don't think anybody else in the band had any idea of what it was about. And I don't think they were very interested. In fact, I know they weren't interested. And so that was one thing. He also brought uh, a discipline to the production of the record. He would sit in the studio for hour after hour with Nick trying to get the drum tracks in time and eventually did. And so he provided the record with a pocket, you know, a rhythmic kind of pocket within which the songs could sit and be listenable to. Pink Floyd drummer Nick Mason, followed by David Gilmore. Saying something about the way the wall was recorded, which is what was quite interesting about it, particularly sort of looking back to uh, things like animals prior to that, where we'd really done it virtually all ourselves. We'd done quite a lot of the engineering ourselves, it was produced and in-house and so on. Um, but one of the interesting things looking back on the wall was that the, the jump we managed to make that time was to go out and find other people to bring in and help. Uh, thinking particularly Bob Ezrin as producer and James Guthrie as engineer. We, we really tried to take a sort of new look at the way we worked. I, mean, I, th I think it, it was a, a good choice, uh, I mean a good thing to do at the time. But it, it's, um, it was just sort of thinking back to some of that. It was very different to the way we'd worked previously. I certainly think that we wanted to make a move forward and we f were feeling the need to break out of the, the smallness of our circle, if you like, a little bit, and get, get some other opinions and, and minds on it, if you like. And um, it, was a, it was a significant, a good move for us, I think, to do that. According to Roger Waters, that's a candid recording of an actual telephone operator there on Young Lust from Pink Floyd's of The Wall. That's the best bit in terms of the theatre, of the record. I'll tell you what happened. I wanted to get across somehow that the guy's calling his wife and she's got a lover. So I thought, well, how about if I ring up the operator and ask an operator to telephone, to call this number collect in London and tell her that I'm calling my wife and have a prearranged, I prearranged that somebody in London would pick the phone up and say hello and then when she had collect call for Mrs. Floyd from Mr. Floyd, will you accept the charges? Just hang up. And then I would keep asking this person to... Re and and, the, and the, the lady who is on the record was only the second operator I tried. The first one didn't get it at all. 
but the second one who is on the record her imagination just went berserk and she immediately realized that my wife was having an affair with somebody else <laughs> and, and all that stuff of and it's a man answering and uh is there is there supposed to be anybody else there she did that was just this woman getting excited about the thought that she was listening to the breakdown of a marriage going on the recording sessions for the wall were spread over eight months four studios and two continents one each in new york city and los angeles and two studios in the south of france in fact the British version of the IRS, called The Revenue, was one of the financial considerations that dictated such international studio hopping. Roger Waters makes another surprising revelation. Well, we were going to do it in London, and then we had an extraordinary reverse in that uh, we had um, channeled a lot of money into... Um, a company in London who was supposed to be uh, investing it and so forth and uh, unfortunately they stole it all instead but they stole it in a way that the uh, the revenue in England still wanted us to pay tax on it so five years after Dark Side of the Moon we were completely skint having got this piece of work that looked as if it might be a good a good one we decided uh, reluctantly uh, to go and um, make the record in the south of France but I I confess that the reasons for making the record in the in the south of France were uh, purely for the fear of being broke the wall like many of Pink Floyd's albums is punctuated with ambient sounds jarring noises pieces of conversations the noise of television shows and the stunningly real sound of helicopters Roger Waters says those helicopter sounds were recorded at an airport near Los Angeles by engineer Brian Christian. He went to Burbank and he recorded, uh, I think it's a Jet Ranger, and he did it with a Sennheiser gun mic, and that's the sound, and he did a great job. It's a really nice track. In fact, Kate Bush, a couple of years ago, wanted to use a helicopter on one of her records, and she tried to record helicopters and couldn't. She rang up and asked me if she could use that sound effect, and could I give it to her? And I said, sure, just give the band a credit on the record and you're welcome to it and send her a copy of it over. And she used it, I believe. I'm not sure which record it was, but I believe she used it. So Brian did that. Uh, Brian also smashed the TV set wearing goggles, you know, and with a sort of sledgehammer. And that was in the parking lot of Producers Workshop in L.A. So ends part one of our 30th anniversary, Peak Over the Wall. Next week at the same time, you'll learn from Roger Waters, Nick Mason, and David Gilmore how this album rose to number one on the sales charts, won a Grammy Award for sound engineering, and has gone on to sell 23 million copies in the U.S. alone. That makes it the number two selling original album of all time. I'm Redbeard. I'll be back in the studio after this. And I refuse to do it outdoors. Larry Maggid, bless him, the main promoter in Philadelphia, said, please, please come and do it. He'd seen the show in L.A. and then he said, please, please come and do it in JFK Stadium in Philadelphia outdoors. He said, I will guarantee you a clear million dollars a night to do it. Uh, but how can you do a show that's about the alienation that you feel about doing stadium shows in a stadium? Roger Waters in the studio for the wall. In the studio with Red Beard. This is David Gilmore of Pink Floyd. Welcome back in the studio. I'm Nick Mason of Pink Floyd with Red Beard. The members of Pink Floyd were never very comfortable with stardom. They were, for the most part, a band without a face. Even as they were selling millions of records and selling out huge stadiums, many of their fans would have been hard-pressed to recognize a single member on the street. Some knew that David Gilmour was the guitarist, that Roger Waters played bass, and that the two of them wrote most of the songs. But most fans couldn't tell one member of Pink Floyd from the other. But as much as the members of Pink Floyd resisted it, a certain amount of celebrity was unavoidable. There was no way to play concerts in front of 50,000 people and hope to remain truly anonymous. There was no way to avoid being mobbed, being followed, being worshipped. It was that last part, the idolatry of it all, 
that bothered Roger Waters the most. Waters saw a dark side to the spotlight, and it frightened him. The sheer size, the unreality of it all, seemed dangerous to Waters. Those were the emotions that led him to write The Wall. It was an album about alienation, about distance, about losing touch. But more than that, it was an album about reaching out. Roger Waters built The Wall so that he could finally tear it down. When I go to the movies or listen to records or whatever, uh, just occasionally I see something that moves me to the extent that I feel, well, yeah, I understand that. I can understand this man or this woman. I feel like that too a bit. I get a good feeling knowing that there's somebody else out there who feels the same way. Well, we're getting into the songs of the wall now. You know, does anybody else out there feel the way I do? That's all it's about, really. You know, firing my arrows into the void with the hope that somebody will catch one of them and go, yeah, I recognize this feeling. And uh, it, it gives you, you know, it, well, for me anyway, when I go and see a really good movie that expresses some feeling that I have or something, it gives, it gives me heart to carry on, you know, and it gives me strength to go on trying to be human. When Rolling Stone magazine published a list of the greatest live performances in rock history, high on that list was a tour from the year 1980, a series of shows that Rolling Stone magazine said, and I quote, took the theatrical potential of live rock to its most vivid extreme, end quote. That tour they were talking about was Pink Floyd's The Wall. It was a show so complex and so expensive to produce that it was only performed 32 times. It was a spectacle beyond anything rock and roll audiences had ever seen. It was an assault of light and sound and special effects that no one had dared to even try before. There were crashing planes, electronic creatures, and of course, the wall itself. 35 feet high, 200 feet wide. It was constructed on stage as the audience watched, slowly growing brick by cardboard brick. And when it was finished, Pink Floyd was out of sight, separated from its audience by the wall. Pink Floyd's guitarist, singer David Gilmour, and drummer Nick Mason recall the extremely limited cities in which it, the wall was performed. It was about a week each in... Uh, Los Angeles first. L.A., New York, London, then Dortmund in Germany, then another week in London the following year. So it was it amounted to somewhere between 30 and 35 shows, I should think, something like that. Total, not that many. Certainly not enough to cover the mega costs of putting it on. <laughs> um, very, very difficult to move it around. Um, very reluctant to go on doing it too many times. It was... Um, it was a mega achievement for us to do it, and it was great fun to do, but uh, it was also slightly restrictive as a show, I think. Um, and by the end of it, it was rather like uh, clockwork. We could all do it and do it very well, but it was not terribly challenging by the end. And There were very few points in it where one could break out and have a little play or a little jam or do something slightly different. It was so regimented that it started getting... It was more like performing a West End show, really, than, than playing music. Yeah. Broadway theatrical type production, yeah. Roger Waters confirms that the wall tour just didn't add up. It really was unbelievably expensive to put on. The reason that we did so few shows was because indoors it was really too expensive to countenance. We lost about 600 grand, I think, doing the shows. And so you couldn't really make a case for going on doing it. Uh, because I think what, you know, what the world was getting out of it was not worth the expense of, of putting it on. And I refused to do it outdoors. Larry Maggid, bless him, the main promoter in Philadelphia, said, please, please come and do it. He'd seen the show in L.A. and then he said, he said, please, please come and do it in JFK Stadium in Philadelphia outdoors. He said, I will guarantee you a clear million dollars a night to do it. Uh, but how can you do a show that's about the alienation that you feel about doing stadium shows in a stadium? David Gilmore points out that Bob Ezra had been brought into the recording sessions for The Wall as an outside producer. We were, we were all directing, we were all directing, and, and, but Bob was another intelligent, discerning person who certainly had some very good input onto it, the way and had a lot of strength as well to uh, say, you know, this piece just isn't good enough, you know, this song isn't strong enough, and let's 
think again, start again, you know, which happened many, many times, you know. And you get Roger going off home in a huff because we said we didn't like something. And he'd shoot off home and he'd, like two days later, he'd come back in with something much better. And he sort of rage <laughs> and anger at having something turned down. He'd say, well, I'll show you, motherfucker. He'd come back in with something far better. Nobody home was like that. And nobody went off angry about something and the next day time he came in with nobody home which is fantastic that's nobody home with vocal by roger waters from the wall waters and david gilmore return in the studio next as the cinematic properties of the wall inspire a major motion picture i'm redbeard visit in the studio.net for this and your other favorite interviews you're in the studio for the 30th anniversary of pink floyd's the wall part two in the studio with Redbeard. This is David Gilmore of Pink Floyd. Welcome back in the studio. I'm Nick Mason of Pink Floyd with this, Redbeard. This is Roger Waters in the studio for The Wall. Thank you, gentlemen. This is part two of our 30th anniversary of Pink Floyd's The Wall. From the beginning, Roger Waters envisioned The Wall concept cinematically, more than just a rock album. And in 1982, a film version was released in theaters, directed by noted filmmaker Alan Parker, who had already directed Midnight Express and Fame, and would go on to make Angel Heart, Mississippi Burning, and Evita. Roger Waters wrote the screenplay for The Wall Movie. I always thought that it might make a movie. Alan Parker expressed a great interest in it, and we talked and talked, and I started writing odd bits of screenplay, and I don't know, it just slowly happen. To start with it was going to be a kind of combination of a uh, show film, you know, of rock and roll concert film with illustrations of what the concert was about. And it stopped being that quite quickly and turned into what it eventually became. With a melody left over from David Gilmour's first solo album sessions in 1978, that's Comfortably Numb, lyrics by Roger Waters and vocal and guitar solo by David Gilmour. The lead character of Pink in the film version of The Wall was played by then lead singer of the Boomtown Rats, Bob Geldof, later to be knighted by the Queen of England for organizing the live aid famine relief effort. Roger Waters remembers how Bob Geldof was cast in the lead for the film version of The Wall. Alan suggested him, and I said, yeah, good idea, great idea, see if he's interested. And so he called him up, and he wasn't interested, but he decided to do it anyway. In fact, there's a very funny story. He um, was asked to do it, and he was going to do some gigs on the continent, and he went with Fochno O'Kelly, who was his manager at the time, I don't know, maybe he still is, to the airport, and he was going, I've been asked to do this Pink Floyd bloody war thing, what a load of crap, and raw bloody rubbish I, they send me this I can't uh, and Faulkner was trying to persuade him that it would be a good career move and da 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 and bloody bloody blah and da 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 and none of this would ever have come to light except that my brother was the cab driver I laid this on Geldof later at the time he could not believe it quite rightly because what an incredible coincidence it was my brother John anyway at least at least uh, Bob and I never had any kind of um you know, there was never any pussyfooting about what he thought about Pink Floyd and the music and so on and so forth, because he was extremely scathing about the whole thing. And I never tried to persuade him differently. You know, these bog Irish, you can't tell them anything. They wouldn't understand. There's no point in me wasting my... I'm not going to waste my education on Geldof trying to explain the wall to him. He understands. He just doesn't realise he understands. Because he does understand, he does understand. And if there's one man in the world who understands, it's got to be Geldof. Bless him. Casting a then-Irish punk rocker as the film lead was no more eyebrow-raising than the personnel on the Wall album. Among the backing vocalists were Bruce Johnston of the Beach Boys and Tony Tennille of The Captain and Tennille. I'm serious. Originally, Roger Waters had opted for the actual Beach Boys themselves with a certain measure of political incorrectness proved to be problematic. I got a call from Bruce and said, I'm not sure that um, the Beach Boys want to sing uh, that one looks Jewish and that one's a coon and that one's a queer and all of that. I, I don't think that's really where the Beach Boys are at. But if you want that vibe, that sound, I can put you together a team who will do it. And the team was Bruce, 
Tony Tennille, John Joyce, Jim Haas, Stan Farber and Joe Chamay. See, I can even remember their names because they were such... They were great guys and they made a fantastic section. And, and in fact, whenever I play in L.A. now, uh, the four guys who came on the road with us, which was Jim, John, Stan and Joe, they always come and do my gig. They come and sing in the flesh. And they still got John Joyce, who was the kind of, uh, the one who kind of, I don't know, he's, he's kind of the leader. I think he's because he's the smallest. He's still got the music. And they arrive with the music and we sit down in the, uh, you know, in the band room and go, yeah, it went like this, bam, and they do it. And then we do it on stage. If you ever want anybody to do Beach Boys impersonations, they're your guys. Next, we conclude our two-part look at Pink Floyd's 30th anniversary of The Wall with revelations from both David Gilmour and Roger Waters on the eventual demise of their creative relationship. While The Wall album ascends to sell 23 million copies, tied for number two as the most popular in U.S. history. For this and your other favorite interviews, visit inthestudio.net. I'm Redbeard. You're in the studio for the conclusion of Pink Floyd's The Wall 30th anniversary. The game. In the studio with Red Beard. This is David Gilmore of Pink Floyd. Welcome back in the studio. I'm Nick Mason of Pink Floyd with this Red Beard. This is Roger Waters in the studio for The Wall. Thanks again, guys. It's the 30th anniversary of The Wall, voted number 87 on Rolling Stone Magazine's top 500 albums of all time. David Gilmore and Roger Waters have always had very different personalities. Gilmore tends to be pragmatic and laid back, while Roger Waters is a more emotional, more volatile person. Even as early as the release of Dark Side of the Moon in 1973, the differences between Gilmore and Waters were affecting their relationship. But by 1979's recording sessions for The Wall, they were openly adversarial. Here's David Gilmore of Pink Floyd. The arguments and fights that myself and Roger had during the latter half of making the album were pretty intense on certain things. We had some real major scraps on, on certain things and that left our relationship a bit more damaged at the end of that album. And again, in the film, I, there were one or two things that happened during the film that I felt that I absolutely had to do that I know Roger's never forgiven me for. <laughs> Basically, on outvoting him and telling him that he had to stay in line on certain things which are very sort of hard to explain, but uh, when you've got millions of dollars invested in a project, there are certain protections that you have to stick to, that I felt I had to stick to. And uh, so I, I was the only one around who could actually take on the role of overruling him and telling him that there were certain things that he couldn't do. And I, I think that period, our, our relationship probably became irreparably damaged and remained that way through the final cut album which was torture Roger Waters in the studio let's be honest about this uh, by the time we were doing The Wall the band really didn't exist but by the time we got into The Wall really it was my band I, it was my work and we did what I said and the others did as they were told and that was all there was to it if your perception was that the, here was the ultimate band and every, you know, and we were all sort of jolly and happy and cooperating it wasn't like it wasn't like that. I'm not saying I did it all because I didn't. Obviously, Dave Gilmore's um, contribution to the making of the Wall was huge. Uh, you know, he's a marvelous guitarist, and uh, he contributed to you know a number of songs in terms of their construction and so on and so forth. But we were not a together unit. But the band was really. You know, difficult yeah and the live shows of the war were the swan song you know, that was it that was all that we could possibly achieve it was over run like hell was written by david gilmore and roger waters appearing on the wall the dispute between Roger Waters and the other three members of Pink Floyd became quite public in the latter 1980s after Waters left the band and then tried to prevent the remaining three from recording and touring under the Pink Floyd name. The dispute has long since been settled, but in November 1979, at the time of The Wall's release, it wasn't public knowledge. By July 2nd, 2005's Live 8 Worldwide Charity Concert broadcast, 
Time and loss had combined to mollify the rancor that had erupted between Waters and the rest of Pink Floyd. Longtime band manager Steve O'Rourke and the brilliant orchestrator on the wall, Michael Kamen, both had died. Roger Waters performed with Rick Wright, Nick Mason, and David Gilmore as a one-off reunion. Gilmore appeared uncomfortable during the performance as Waters looked uncharacteristically gleeful. So I asked David if he had any regrets about the Live 8 reunion. Well, no regrets. I was um, in two minds about it before doing it. In fact, I initially turned it down because I thought it would distract from um, the project I'm, I've been working on and wasn't um, unaware of the sort of hornet's nest that would get uh, opened up by doing it. But, um, you know, there was something much more important at stake, so obviously it was better to get in there and do it. And, and deal with a certain amount of rubbish at the same time. You know, the important thing is it uh, was taking part in that event in order to try and persuade those uh, leaders of those eight countries that they should um, put their hands in their pockets and dig out some cash and uh, free a lot of countries from the burdens of, the, of servicing the debts that they had. Um, and all the other sort of rubbish pales into insignificance alongside of that and um, so that other insignificant rubbish it's amongst that it's very good personally for me and Roger to be able to put a bit of the uh, the, the bad vibes that have gone on behind us um, and, and get up there and, and, and play a gig so that that was fun and um I'm very pleased in the end that I did it. Together with that, I mean, I, it, it, it sort of served as closure on that period of my life. And I'm very, very sort of happy and satisfied musically, artistically with my whole career within Pink Floyd. In, in, in the early days with Roger and in the latter years too, you know, I, I've had a great time, a great opportunity to, to do pretty much whatever I wanted and all that thing. But um, I do feel now it's time for something different. I have a different partnership in in life and love as well as in music with, with Polly, who's um, a great writer. I feel very musically, artistically satisfied by, by where I am right now. Roger Waters stunned the rock world back in summer 1989 when he told me, right here in the studio, that the winds of change swirling through communist Eastern Europe could blow new symbolism into the wall. And the second half was really about breaking through the wall. And, but there was a hotel room built into it that flapped down. Oh, it went on and on and on. It was, I have to say... It was absolutely wonderful. And I may say also that I'm toying with the idea of doing it again because one of the things that I got out of my acrimonious departure from my ex-colleagues was all the rights to all of that. It was the only thing I ever really insisted on was that I got the wall. So I might even do it again. I thought what would be a good idea would be... Uh, I, I'm, I'm told that they're, they're thinking seriously about tearing down the wall in West Berlin uh, as a sort of uh, theatrical gesture when they do it. I might try and persuade, um, who is it, Helmut Kong, who's in charge over there now, to, you know, to build this thing at the Brandenburg Gate or at, at Checkpoint Charlie or something. We'll build it there. And that's the only place that I would ever do it outdoors. And we'll have a kind of a, a symbolic tearing down of the wall at the end of a, of a, of a production of, of the wall. Because I think it would be apposite at that point if they decide to destroy that thing. Re-recorded to commemorate his performance of The Wall at the remains of the Berlin Wall, July 21st, 1990. That's Roger Waters with Another Brick, 1990. Waters also revealed that he has the 1980 and 1981 concerts on film. And yes, he may make them available for those of us who weren't lucky enough to see the original show. It was filmed in, in 1980 and 1981 in London. I've got that. I've got all that. And I am putting it together. I'm, I just, I don't want to, you know, sell it. 
really. Not because I want to keep... Uh, not because I don't want anybody to see it. I'm not quite sure why I don't want to. But it is there, and at some point it will be available for anybody who didn't... You see, I've always been very reluctant to um, release... Uh, well, I've never cut it or anything, but I am thinking about it now. But I've always been right because it was a very strong theatrical experience for the people who were there. On, but on video, it will really be a kind of historical document. You know, it can't possibly be the event because, you know, you needed to be there with another 12,000 people with the quadraphonic sound and with the aeroplane going. But nevertheless, for people like you, who never saw it, it would be, and who are, you know, fans of the music and interested, it would be a very interesting document. I wouldn't call it a performance, but I would say a document, a record of the event. So you can at least see what happened, but you will never be able to have been there, if you see what I mean. The end of the wall. We'll be back in the studio after this. This is Redbeard in the studio thanking Nick Mason, David Gilmore, and Roger Waters. This edition of In the Studio is dedicated to the memories of Rick Wright and Pink Floyd, longtime manager Steve O'Rourke, and the wall orchestrator Michael Tiemann. They've all passed away. May they rest in peace. Visit InTheStudio.net for this and your other favorite interviews. In the Studio was written this edition by yours truly Redbeard and by Joe Rose. Transcription by Jane Carpenter Brunat. Theme song by Andy Timmons. In the Studio is now in its 22nd consecutive year. Produced by Barbarossa Limited. Copyright 2009. All rights reserved. Be a part of the In the Studio network at InTheStudio.net. In the Studio is distributed by Radio K&G.